Hello, everyone. Wow, I'm just taking a moment to take in this crowd because this is sensational. This is so, so exciting. We are all so thrilled to be here to talk about probably our favorite topic, mental health. We all love it. We're all passionate about it. And I'm really excited for us to have a conversation about the things that we think are really important to think about and to consider. And we hope that we'll give you a little bit of food for thought for your own experiences and your own journeys. And we hope we inspire you, maybe give you a laugh or two. And let's go ahead and get started. I'm going to start off by introducing our very esteemed panelists. I'm Dr. Jessica Stern, and I am moderating. But let me go ahead and introduce these folks. Now the first panelist, do I need to introduce her? Probably not. I'm going to do it. Yeah, <laughs> Elena. Hi. <laughs> Woo Selena Gomez is one of the most globally and culturally celebrated artists, actors, producers, entrepreneurs, and philanthropists of her generation. Philanthropy and activism have been key pillars of Gomez's career. Gomez has used her platform to advocate for many important causes, including mental health, where she has been a leading voice in changing the stigma. She is a co-founder of Wondermind alongside her mother, Mandy Teefee. Thank you, Selena, for everything that you do. Thank you. Mandy Teefee is co-founder and CEO of Wondermine, as well as executive producer of the Emmy-nominated content 13 Reasons Why and Living Undocumented. She is a patron of Women in Film and a member of the Producers Guild of America, and her philanthropic endeavors include Alliance for Children's Rights, Mentoring Youth, Mental Health Rights, and Organ Donation. Mandy launched Wondermine in 2021 with the core strategy to achieve democratization and destigmatization of mental health by launching the world's first mental health fitness ecosystem, along with Selena. Thank you, Mandy. Next, we have Dr. Corey Yeager, who is a researcher, psychotherapist, and advocate, and author of his new book, How Am I Doing? 40 Conversations to Have with Yourself. Dr. Yeager's therapeutic practices range from the NBA, NFL, UFL, to an array of entertainment spaces. Corey and his wife have five sons and call Minneapolis home. Thank you, Dr. Yeager, for being here today. And last but not least, we've got Solomon Tonis, who is NFL defensive lineman, where he uses his platform to advocate for mental health to break stigma. He's also the co-founder of the defensive line, along with his parents, Chris and Martha. He's a wonderful advocate for mental health, and I'm so glad he's here. Just very briefly, I'm Dr. Jessica Stern. I'm a clinical psychologist, speaker, consultant. I'm founder and CEO of Three Lemons LLC, which does all sorts of speaking and consulting around mental health. I'm also a clinical psychologist and a clinical assistant professor at NYU Langone Health. And I am beyond honored to be here to talk about mental health with you all. <laughs> all right. Now that the intros are in place, let's get down to business. So what we wanted to do and we want to accomplish with this panel is to have a conversation about the aspects of mental health that tend to, we shy away from them. We are maybe a little bit uncomfortable with them. We don't really know what to say. We know that there's a ton of mental health stigma. And I think what's so spectacular about these folks is that they have done an exquisite job in being able to break that stigma and to be able to challenge individuals to think about mental health in a way that is authentic and raw. And so that's really our goal today, is to have those conversations together and with you guys. And so I wanted to think of different questions that we can talk about that relate to the value systems that we have in this space, in our missions, in the brands that we work with, in the companies that we try to achieve great missions with. And really what we want to do is talk about the gritty, the fun, the interesting, the entertaining, and make this conversation just really approachable. So let's get started. The question I have for you to start us off is, how has opening up about your mental health experiences, personally and those close to you, 
really change the way in which you think about mental health and the way in which you engage in conversations in your own life and with the people around you. Oh, um, I guess for me, um, I have to be honest, I was, I released a documentary and I was terrified to do it and I went back and forth on whether I'd do it or not. And um, I think the moment I did that, I felt this insane amount of release because there wasn't any hiding anymore. There wasn't, there wasn't just this image that people could see and think, oh, it looks nice. And it was probably one of the hardest moments of my life. So I would say um, it's helped release a lot of anxiety of keeping it in just to let people know I'm having, I'm having a hard day or, or I just need a minute. Selena, I'm curious about what you just said because I think that's so powerful. As you went back and forth and this felt like maybe a scary decision, what prompted you to decide to do it? Probably, probably for everyone who's been in that position too. I think meeting, releasing a song I uh, wrote called Lose You to Love Me and I had women coming up to me and single moms and and just telling them how, or hearing their stories, and it just moved me, and I felt like I could, I could sacrifice myself so that others could see what it might really be like, I guess. That's amazing. Yeah, I think that deserves a pretty significant round of applause. <laughs> think I, think, I think there's something important here that, that Selena just touched on. Um, and this is the idea that behind the scenes of our lives, there is a ton of adversity that people face. But oftentimes in this day and age, we have to some degree decontextualized our existence. We see Instagram posts and all the beautiful flash that, that people have. Solomon is doing great work. Selena, Mandy doing great work. And we all see that. But behind the scenes, what we don't get to see is the grind the adversity, the struggle, the tears, all of those things that go into the existence of being a human, the human condition. So let's pay attention to contextualizing our lives. And I think that's what Selena just really touched on, that she gave the opportunity to be vulnerable so we could see some of those other aspects that she works through on a continuous basis, just like all of us, right? I think that's really important to point out. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, to answer your question, uh, Dr. Jessica, um, yeah, to being open and honest about my mental health wasn't something that I always was doing. Like, it took time to get here. Like, I always wasn't vulnerable, always wasn't just talking about my deepest, darkest secrets, um, you know, my really sad emotions. Like, I had to go through a journey. And for me, that journey looked really different. Um, you know, I was raised by two beautiful parents, had an amazing sister um, who always let me be sensitive and emotional at home. But it, that was my safe place at the time. But in reality, I was always in the locker room, um, you know, around football players, around other, other guys. And um, there, like, being emotional, being sensitive wasn't something that was allowed. Um, it wasn't a safe place. It was rejected. And, like, even to be honest, like, growing up, like, those are things that we made fun of. Like, we made fun of guys for crying. We made fun of guys for being sensitive. So, like, getting into this work was, like, like a really hard journey for me. And then after that, like you hit by a hurricane and you, you find out that your sister uh, is really struggling with mental health. And so I'm later in life trying to erase all these things that I've learned, all these certain ways I live by, um, trying to erase this archaic mindset that I live by of being a man, being tough. If I get any feelings, like suppress them or rub dirt on it uh, and trying to find a way to help my sister. And by that time it was too late and I unfortunately lost my sister to suicide and I'm hit in this world of mental health and you know, it's taken a storm over me. Um, I don't know how to handle these emotions. I'm going through this journey of grief. Um, you know, I don't know how to put my depression and grief and anxiety into words and I'm just trying to live by every day. And uh, you know, it, I had to do the work. I had to go to therapy. You know, I was, I was in a place where my back was against the wall. You know, I felt like I couldn't go to sleep. I felt like, felt like I couldn't wake up. Like, was just stuck in a place where I didn't even know at the time, but it, I was stuck in suicide ideation. Like, I, I just didn't want to be here anymore. Um, but luckily, I went through that work and I went to therapy. And I learned how to put my emotions into words. And I learned how to identify my depression. And I learned how to um, move along and understand that, hey, it's okay not to be okay. Like, my sister, thank you.
like my sister just died by suicide. I'm not supposed to be happy. I'm not supposed to be posting my highlights on Instagram. I'm supposed to be doing the work to find out how I can, you know, be myself again. Um, but being able to get to the strength and get to the place where I could talk about my emotions and open about, up about these things, um, it's truly impacted and changed my life in, in the biggest way. I feel like I can live an authentic life now. I feel like I can be myself unapologetically. Like I've done the work and I've learned about who I am and learned about how I react in certain situations, how I handle my anxiety, what I need to do to fix that, what I need to do to um, live with my depression, like, you know, find out these, these things. And, um, you know, it's connecting with people more than I ever have ever thought I could. Like you have these conversations and like you talk to these people and you might not even talk to them directly, but you have a new connection because we're all human and we're all going through these things. You may never see it, but it's important to talk about these things. And it's why I just have so much respect for everyone on this stage because it's hard to get here. It's really hard work and it's hard to be able to talk about these things, but it's needed because people are struggling and um, this world definitely needs it. more people speaking up. I am very moved by each one of you. I think it's so inspiring, so impactful, and as a psychologist who does therapy, I, I deliver therapy in both individual and group ways, and the way in which all of you are willing, and not just willing, but excited to be vulnerable, it sounds like a strange word to use with the word vulnerability, but you're all motivated, inspired to do so, and that's where all the impact happens, and I salute you all. Thank you for being so honest and open. I think it's really impactful. Another thing I was thinking about in anticipation of this panel, but I think even struck me now as we're having this conversation really palpably is the way in which we change our thinking related to mental health and language. And something I work with in therapy when I'm doing therapy, but I've also thought very critically in my own life and my own experience is the way in which the narrative and the words that we use around our mental health has changed. So for instance, it starts off oftentimes for a lot of people with shame, where they find that the ways in which they describe their emotions and their thoughts is couched in shame or confusion or guilt. And then hopefully over the course of time, those emotions will build to more and more nuance and will add a little bit more dimension to our thoughts and maybe feel a little bit more empowered to talk about our mental health journeys. So in this vein, I'm curious, how has the way in which you've talked about your mental health, both internally in your own minds and maybe externally with other folks, changed throughout the course of your mental health journey? I can answer that one. <laughs> um, before I really understood what mental health meant, I always knew that I felt different than other people and I didn't understand the feelings that I was having. And so it was just easy to chalk up and go, oh, I'm just crazy. And I didn't realize that that was negatively affecting me. And, and so I was like, oh, I'm crazy. And then I have ADHD, which is basically a learning disability. And so I'm stupid. And it really took a long time for me to once I did that, I was allowing other people to speak to me that way. And so then it becomes my truth. And that, that, that's not the truth of what is going on with someone who has something in, you know, going on in the mental health capacity. So I, I feel like the language in general has always been there. We just now have like more access to it. And I feel that there, it's been so misguided even from day one, you know, because in order to understand how we need to speak to each other, we have to understand each other. And until we are willing to not have fear against the unknown and we are able to just really have these conversations because, you know, I can say, oh, I have ADHD or I have trauma. I can tell right away how that person feels about me. Like, if they're even going to do business with me, they'll be like, oh, we don't know what we're going to get with her, you know? And so, partly of what we want to do at Wondermind is really kind of change that narrative and really encourage people that don't have access to resources and to democratize it and destigmatize it so that we can all just like flourish into our best because I've always spoken negative with myself and I had to learn the role. It's like if I wouldn't say it to my best friend, I'm not allowed to say it to myself. Preach. 
Let me say, to that point, that's, I think that's particularly important, that the language that we use with one another is extremely important, right? That's important, how we convey what, our, what we're thinking and feeling. But the language that we use within ourselves is even more important. The, the conversations that I have with myself, the negative patterns that start to occur. One thing that we must know about negative and positive patterns, negative patterns are easy to just fall into. You don't have to really get, do any work to fall in to negative thinking. And then one negative thought leads to another, and now we're deeply down this rabbit hole. Positive thinking makes, you have to make a move towards that. You have to be, really move yourself into that positive thinking. So I think one of the things that we must get better at is giving grace to ourselves, right? We, we're pretty good as human beings of giving grace to someone else. If Solomon does something, I don't know him real well, I'll say, nah, it's all right, bud, don't worry about it. That's grace. I won't give that same grace to myself. I won't, I'll beat myself up. If you took a transcript of the way I talked to myself and handed it, handed it to somebody and they read it back to me, I'm ready to fight. Because I'm so, I can be so negative about myself, with myself, right? So if I say it to people all the time, players that I work with, the world oftentimes will line up against us. I'm not gonna stand in that line with you though. I'm for me. I'm going to be for me, and I'm going to move in that way. So giving that grace to ourselves, I think, is critically important. Yeah, um, I think the way that I've changed the language I use with mental health has changed dramatically over the years, whether it's learning from other mental health advocates or from professionals. Um, like, first, like, I like to change the way that we talk about suicide. Like, a lot of people say committed suicide. I think it's important to reverse it to hey, they die by suicide. Because someone doesn't commit cancer, they don't commit ALS, and we need to treat mental health and suicide, depression, PTSD, bipolar disorder with the same respect as every other disease out there. <laughs> And then on a personal level, I had to change my self-talk within myself and how I spoke to myself. Like I'm, a, I'm an athlete and I got to where I got to by being hard on myself. By always telling myself, you're not good enough, you need to do more, more is good. Like, and just, that was a way that I kind of ruminated in my head. Um, but when I got to the NFL, I, I kept trying to do that. And I was deteriorating myself. I destroyed my confidence and it was gone. So I had to learn how to talk to myself differently through mental health coaches, through sports psychologists, um, you know, just trying to teach me how to talk to myself again, whether that's, whether that's in terms of saying I will, I can, um, I am the best, I am confident, I am strong. Like during games now, like after, after a series, I'll go to the sideline, I'll listen to my coach, but then I'm pa pacing the sideline back and forth, just talking to myself, saying affirmations. I'm saying, I believe myself, I will have my best game, I am confident, I am the best. Um, just because I've, I've been playing football almost 18 years now, and in 16 of those years, I would talk to myself terribly, so I can't give a chance for those thoughts to creep in. Um, and then like the last way I'd say I've really changed my mental health language is um, really through listening. Um, you know, because when someone opens up and talks to us, we always feel like we have to fix them. We have to have the perfect thing to say. And really, like, I think that that language is huge is to tell someone, hey, I'm here for you. I'm a safe place and I'll listen. And even while we're listening, I learned this at a conference where I was sp speaking at during the season. Um, and one of the, pr the professionals say, like a lot of the time when we're listening to people, we say, hey, I understand your pain. Hey, I feel your pain. And he was like, he was telling us, like, that's not possible at all. Because you never know what that person is actually going through inside their head. You don't know how they're taking it. You don't know how they're, um, you know, handling their emotions. So he said, instead say, hey, I can't imagine how you're feeling. And in doing this, I was able to see people in their eyes to see how much more validated they feel and just how more important they feel. Um, but yeah, th these are the ways I change my mental health. And you know, I think it's just important to, important to incorporate it into sentences and to, into, into and just in the, in the conversation, just like letting people know, hey, like in the locker room, hey, I'm going through therapy. Like um, I, was, I was talking to my therapist last night, just to make these conversations more normal. Or when someone asks me how I'm doing, like being honest with them, like, hey, hey, I'm good, but I'm also a little anxious. Like I've got the speaking event coming up. There's 1,700 people in here, you know, so I'm a little nervous. But, you know, just, just making sure people understand that, hey, like these are all normal things to talk about. And the more we can make it normal, normal conversation, the more people can be vulnerable and we can open up these small safe spaces, small, small all safe places that might save somebody's life. You never really know. Mm -hmm. 
Selena, I'm curious about you. With coming out with a documentary, did that change at all the way that you spoke about mental health and the way that you thought about the language that you used yourself and some of the self-criticism? Yeah, I, uh, we shot the documentary six years um, and it makes me sick to hear the things that I was saying about myself in the beginning. Um, it bums me out because mm. I... Uh, but I but I think everybody can relate to that feeling, mm -hmm. you know, I think like everyone was sharing It's important to speak to yourself with with kindness, but I don't think I really understood that mm -hmm. It's funny because all the things I was bitching about then I'm grateful for now. So mm -hmm. it's really um, ironic, but I'm I, I think it has taught me a lot about myself and letting I mean, it's weird being able to see myself so long ago saying those things that I would never say to myself now. So, weird. <laughs> yeah. And that perspective, too, is really fascinating to be able to look back and for all of us to see how the way that we think about ourselves and our experiences changes. And maybe we're grateful for things now that we weren't back then. And sometimes that can be pretty cool. In terms of thinking about these moments where you decided to either open up or share a story or create a foundation, for some people maybe it was a moment in time, sometimes it was maybe a little bit of accumulation of experiences. I'm curious for each one of you, was there that sort of aha moment or was it a slow build in terms of when you decided you wanted to start to be a little bit more authentic with your experiences and open up to the world about your mental health? Yeah, my moment actually came at the beginning of season two on 13 Reasons Why. I was crumbling. Uh, everything was like catching up to me. I had spent all these years investing my energy in avoiding what my problems were by helping other people and, and like giving all myself away. And I ran out of fuel. And then I said, you know what? You have to practice what you preach. And I called one person and I got on a plane and I went to a treatment center and I stayed there for 30 days. And it was the first time that I had ever had to sit in what and who I was. And it was very scary. It was lovely because you had no cell phone. But like, <laughs> it was like, you know, you, you go and you like spin this like, like weird relationship with yourself and you can see how disconnected you are. And you're, you're like, I even t started trying to navigate, oh, like, oh, I can help her. And I was like, no, like you have to, you have to focus on yourself. And so for me, that was, that was the, the day. I was having seizures. I was like sad. I was crying every day. I was, I was just like not happy. And I don't know that I would have made it had I not gone. And I was fortunate enough to go and have the resources for that. And when I, when I was there, some people didn't have the resources and they were being asked to leave. And that was like a big marker for me of going, shit, that's wrong. Like, I, can I give them my insurance? How can I help them? How can I keep them? Like, the, they're, they're like talking about suicide. Like, how are you gonna let them leave? And it was, um, it, it struck a chord in me. It's like, we need to really take the time to understand who, our, who the world is and run like Wondermind looks like from the outside in. So Wondermind is, all of you and you tell us what you need and we navigate that and find that and help find the resources so they can get the need that the they can get what they need i i absolutely love that um one of the things that mandy just touched on is is something again that i think is really important and this is the idea of giving yourself the opportunity to be in the mirror of your life. Oftentimes we, we avoid the mirror, why? Well, the mirror knows all. The only person that knows all of Corey is Corey. I know every single story about me. There's no one else in the world that does. My mom has a lot of the stories. My wife has a number of stories, but I'm the only one that holds every story. 
So that I think makes us nervous to sit with ourselves because there's things that I don't want to think about that I've done in my life or write thoughts that I don't want to have. So how do you find that ability to stay with yourself and be graceful to yourself um, on a consistent basis, not just once or twice, but consistently, how can we do that? We have to build that with intention. That takes intentionality. That's that moving to positive thinking. Even when I look at the flawed version of myself in the mirror, I'm still positive. I still love that person. Um, and I think we've got work to do on that. Yeah, I think uh, that spark was really hard for me to find because um, I really wasn't, I didn't really want to be in this world. I didn't think I would ever kind of kind of be up here. Like I felt um, a lot of shame around the way I was feeling. Like I feel like I shouldn't be feeling like this, like to a point where like I was in that bad self-talk, calling myself crazy, saying I shouldn't be feeling like this and you know, didn't know how to process it. Like on top of that, like I was a third pick in the draft and um, I felt like if I talked about the wrong things going on in my life, people would be telling me that I'm making excuses for not playing the right way or not playing good enough. Um, and then even more like on paper, like you, if you looked at my life when I was struggling, like my life on paper looked perfect. Like I was a third pick in the draft, just got all this money, living the dream that I've always wanted to, wanted to live, playing in the NFL. But deep down inside, like I, I, w I was dying, um, you know, and so, you know, my mom was encouraging me to speak and I was just like, hey, like, I'm not ready, mom, like, you know, just give me some time, like trying to trying to get me to go to therapy and I wouldn't do it. Um, a couple opportunities would keep coming and you know, I would keep saying no. Um, but finally, I said yes to opportunity. It was an article on ESPN with Molly Knight and uh, I remember like I, I did, I told Molly, I said, hey, Molly, I'm not comfortable talking about my emotions, what I'm going through, but I'm comfortable talking about my sister. And so I talked about Ella, I talked about the pain she went through, the struggle she went through, um, the light she was in this world, and just the absence of, of her not being here and how, how much the world is missing out of her. Um, in the morning the article came out, you know, I came to work early and, and Molly had texted me. She said, hey, Sally, like, I encourage you to read the article and read the comments and reviews. And I told Molly, like, you know, I told her I would, but in my head I, I thought I wasn't going to. I thought I was just going to pass through and keep living my life. Um, but I parked my car that morning and I read the article. And, you know, I read the, I read the reviews, I read the comments, and, you know, just uncontrollable tears rolling down my face. Um, you know, reading the article about my sister, but then, um, you know, seeing the comments. Like, seeing people saying, hey, thank you for sharing your sister's story. I finally feel seen. I'm like, hey, thank you for sharing your sister's pain. Like, it really helped me through the day. And the ones that really got me were like, hey, thank you for sharing your sister's story. Like, this saved my life. Um, and that's really when, like, the spark hit me. Um, because, like, it was the first time in my life I felt seen. I felt, like, really heard. Um, I didn't feel crazy for the way I felt. Like, I felt like, okay, like, you know, I'm not wild for, like, being depressed or anxious right now. Like, this is all normal. Um, but the spark really grew in me because I finally realized how many people in this world are struggling. You know, how many people are suffering in silence and not talking about their mental health. How many people, like, just are just, just out there, like, not being able to feel like they can be human and be vulnerable. Um, so that's really what set the spark off in me and made me want to do this work and made me want to become a mental health advocate and have me do the work to go to therapy and build the strength to be able to talk about these things and to, you know, have the emotional capacity to be here and to, to, to do these things. But, um, you know, I'm very thankful to be here. I'm very thankful to, um, you know, have gone through that journey and to find that spark because um, it's changed the way I live, the way I connect with people, the way I see the world. Um, and, yeah, I just don't want that to stop. I just want to take a moment to pay tribute to Ella and to everybody else whose life was lost to mental health struggles. This panel is for all of you, but the way that I see it is it's also for them. They struggled, they're not here with us, and whatever we can do to protect ourselves and then help their legacy, we're happy to do. Thank you. How about you, Selena? Was there a moment okay. where you decided you wanted to talk about your mental health? Um, oh, my moment. Uh, to be honest, I just, I work in the weirdest industry. Um, I just felt like I didn't fit in. And I just, I, I, my mom though, I have to be honest, was very vocal and open about how I was feeling, how she was feeling and I think we watched Girl Interrupted when I was like, like 12 and I was like, 
oh, that's what that's what rehab looks like. And I was like <laughs> confused by it. And then we ended up having one of the most honest conversations that we've ever had together. And I really appreciated it. And then it, it allowed me to not be scared. But I will say this, you can't force someone to do it. It's just not, it doesn't work. There was a lot of people that cared about me more than I cared about myself that really wanted me to do things I wasn't ready for. I had to hit my rock bottom and I had to do it at my time and it took a couple of tries, but I'd like to think and hope that I'm in a much better place now. That's amazing. And I think what you just touched on, Selena, and what Solomon touched on a moment ago is that sometimes there is a right time, right? Sometimes you need to find that place in a natural, organic way to arrive at this place where you're ready to talk about the tough stuff and to be vulnerable and to do the work, especially therapy in particular for anyone who's done it. Therapy's work. Yeah. Powerful, meaningful, transformative work, but work nonetheless. Yeah. And Dr. Yeager, I'm curious, is this something that you experience with the clients that you work with, that they need to arrive at this place at some space and time where they're ready to do that work? Yeah, oftentimes I talk to, the, especially the young men that I work with, um, about this perception of being a man, right? Uh, and there's, there's so many different perceptions about what it should look and feel like, um, and more often than not, they're really negative, right? And pushing down um, patterns and, and thoughts all the time. And so what, one of the things that I'll talk briefly about is the two things that we hear more often than not about um, in the psychological realm is anxiety and depression. And we use these terms continuously. Um, but oftentimes we don't really understand deeply what that means. Uh, and I, I, I'm, a, I'm a narrative therapist, so I want to talk, I want to tell stories and listen to stories from my clients all the time. And from those stories, processes will evolve and I will, they'll emerge and I'll, and I'll spit that pattern back to the person I'm working with. Um, but those negative thoughts that come up all the time, all too often become the pattern of our life. We think about these negative things and then our life oftentimes falls in that way. So I'm telling the young people that I'm working with um, that we can be positive about things just as we can be negative, but we've got to work to do it. Um, so it's, it's interesting, it runs a gamut of, of therapeutic pieces. Depression is oftentimes when you ruminate about things that have happened in your past, ruminating, not, almost to a point of being paralyzed by that rumination. Anxiety is ruminating about what may happen in the future. But let us all be clear. The only real moment that we have is right now, where we're at right now. That's the only real thing. Everything else is made up. Even the story that I have from 20 years ago, I embellish. It changes. That's, that's in the past. What may happen in the future, I ruminate, oh, this. There's good research. It says about 85% of the things that we get nervous about never happen but I've already used the energy. I've already used the energy to ruminate about it. Now that energy's gone. So recognizing that this current moment is the most important and only real thing that we have, what I do in this moment will be okay. I'm batting a thousand in my life on making it through my struggles. I'm here, so I'm batting a thousand. I haven't missed yet. That doesn't mean it was easy, but I'm here. So if I can admit to that and understand that, I'll make it for whatever that next struggle is. I love that. The ruminating piece is so true. We waste so much energy on this. And I think it's probably one of the most human experiences that exists. And it's just so powerful. And I think to be able to stop what you're doing and to observe yourself and your experience and what's happening in your mind and, and to take a pause and say, is this actually going to serve me well? is really powerful. An analogy I use in therapy a lot is the highway analogy. You're driving down a highway and maybe there's an appropriate amount of anxiety that's helpful for you. Maybe it gets you to study for the test or to prepare for your interview or to do whatever it might be. But once you realize that you're going too far, take the exit, get off the highway and say, I don't really need to be here anymore. Let's pull over, let's go home, let's park, let's get a coffee, let's do something, you know, get off 
the highway when you need to. Doc, when you say that, I'm reminded of thinking, asking ourselves in the midst of negative thinking, asking ourselves to stop and say, does what I just was thinking about, does it serve me? If the answer is no, in that moment, I can make a choice to change that thinking. Simply, that doesn't mean it's easy. Simple doesn't mean easy. But if I'm in the midst of that negative thinking and can be positive, change that to a positive thought, even like 180 from whatever it was I was negatively thinking about, all of a sudden, that pattern, that new synapse, synapses are, are firing to say, oh, no, we can do this differently, right? I think that's a really important point. Yeah, absolutely. It just allows us to reinvest our energy into the things that are important to us. Something I, I talk a lot about, and I talked a lot about on Baggage Drop, which is Wonder Mind's podcast, is values. And Mandy's heard me talk about values ad nauseum. <laughs> but I love talking about what's really important to you and what your why power is. And I think, Dr. Yeager, to your point, is we can really take that energy that we're ruminating with and be able to invest it in the places that are important to us, the places that are serving us, that are driving us forward. Speaking of Wondermind, um, something that I think is so powerful, and Dr. Yeager and I are both advisors for Wondermind, is that it's this place that is a mental fitness ecosystem, and it's this place where we can build habits, skills, tools to practice mental wellness in a regular way. And so, Selena and Mandy, I would love for you to talk a little bit about what prompted this. And then for the whole panel, I would love to hear from you guys, what are some of the things that you do or recommend to help practice mental wellness on a consistent basis? Um, I'll let my mom answer it, but it honestly stemmed from a conversation that we both had with each other, and it was about our journeys, and we ended up relating a lot to each other, and it was a turning point, and I think it was more like, how can we, how can we do that for other people, and then, you know, you can explain how it became what it became, but it was, it just stemmed from us really wanting to help other, you know, mom and daughters to have like real open, honest conversations that turned into this, so. Yeah, um, yeah when we were exploring um, new avenues of how we could continue the mother-daughter component and really just trying to create like family support amongst the conversations that you can do it together as a family was really the message behind that. We, we realize that there's not one place that you can go to to help you kind of explore whatever you're feeling. So what we did is we decided, since we're not doctors, we, um, are, we are our audience, we are our consumer. And so what we wanted to do was um, build this world with several different pillars from content, film, TV, podcast, uh, product, and by the request of the audience um, that is uh, avid readers of Wondermine, we will be launching an app coming really soon. And it's gonna, it's gonna change the game on, on how we execute and how people actually can practice their mental fitness without like, feeling like they're putting the time because that's like um, as uh, the in 2023 when they did the study it was like collective drama that we all we all experienced and the top three reasons why people don't do therapies they don't have the time they don't have the insurance or they don't believe it works so let's gamify it and see if you can play that game and so we're gonna um, launch that but we wanted a world um, where you can go on a site. We, we launch about 46 articles a month on our content hub that all is broken down by different feelings. So whether you're just having a bad day or you're having feelings you don't understand, we don't diagnose you because that's not, that's not our, our forte. Like, we are not doctors. So it's... Um, it's, it's definitely a place to explore 
what you need to know about you and how you feel, and it's dis- it's a discovery of yourself. It's it's um it th- that's what I think is so beautiful about it is you could spend days and days and days of just comparing other like situations that you were in and then have a different feeling for it. And because it's so important, not only for you to understand yourself, but for us to understand each other. And so that's why I like to say that we um, really practice going out and coming in, inward, because we want to create everything for you. So we know it works, like that, like, the practices in the past, but we want to meet each and every one of you where you are. And in order to do that, we have to understand and we have to run tests and we have to do studies and we have to like, you know, figure it out and deliver, deliver what you're asking for. Because I could deliver all day what I want and might not help anybody. (laughs) So then I'm just like running in circles. So um, I really feel, and and I'll move on after this, but I really, I really feel the mental health movements that we are seeing right now, it's going to be a joint effort by every company that is in the mental health space. It's a, currently a cauldron of all kinds of different practices, whether it's from AI to, to tech to um, talk therapy. It's going to take all of us working together and finding that that narrative to help everybody else it's not going to be one hero company i think we uh, we need to all join hands and really figure this out as a unity so that there isn't misinformation floating around and and let's not forget and i think maybe that maybe it's a human nature let's not forget that only for three, four short years ago, we were in the midst of the most chaotic, social, upheaving moments of our existence. And we don't talk about that a lot. So these young people that were 12 or 13, I have five sons. I had a kid that was in eighth grade, thought he was gonna be out of school for a couple of weeks and it was two years. Mm. So all of a sudden he didn't get to hang out with his buddies. You don't get those two years back, ever. Right, so now the social connections that you make through the adolescent developmental process were disconnected. And you don't really get to reset that. So we don't know even today, the research is beginning to play with it, what the impact will be 10 to 15 years from now for that, this generation of young people from that pandemic. We can't forget. And what I love about what Wondermind is up to is the language of an ecosystem. So if an ecosystem where, where ecologies come together, there's a space where they meet. Think of a suburb and an urban space right where they meet. That is called an ecotone. And then the ecotone is the most variety. So you may watch a twins baseball game in Minneapolis and then drive only a little bit and you almost cross into a suburb and see deer. Right? So you can be in the midst of something. So what Wondermind has decided to do is say, hey, that ecology, that ecotone, let's get more variety. How do we attack and engage and understand what the community is looking for, not dictating to others, here's what we think you all should do. This is what's going to help you. No, 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 no. What is it that your story is? What is your struggle? It's unique to you. How can we all be supportive of that? Right? I want you to support me and make it reciprocal. I want to support you. And I think that's the work that Wondermind is up to in a very unique and cutting edge and innovative way. Uh, and, and I think that's the space that we all want to occupy. Mandy, did you want to share something else? Oh, no, I was just, when he was talking about generations, I just learned that there's a generation called the glass generation. They were actually born during COVID, so all they know is quarantine. They don't know life before that. That's like four years of, of disconnected, like, and we got to be prepared for them coming up in the chain. And so, yeah. That's exactly right. So we have to challenge ourselves. Too often, the elders of communities 
whine about the generations behind them. Oh my God, this generation, they don't, did you hear the music? But the, when, we, when we were that age, our parents were saying the same thing to us. Well, all these kids in that generation. So really realizing that we, whatever the generations that come behind us do is impacted by what, how we treat them, how we understand them, how we listen to them, how are we curious with them. All too often we stand in positions of authority, especially as parents, and we dictate to kids. We need to allow them the opportunity to grow, be a safety net for them, listen to them, be curious with them. That's the best thing I can do as a dad, is to be curious with my babies. Help me understand, son, and I don't agree with you, but help me understand why you think that way, Bubba, so we can all now move forward. So now a question for all of you is what are your, some of your go-to mental fitness tips, the things that keep you fresh, the things that maybe support you when you're going through a tough time? What are some of your coping strategies, the things that you keep in your toolbox? I am a huge believer in having a well-stocked toolbox that's going to need to replenish at times. It's going to need to change through different seasons of our lives. So the toolbox we have now is gonna maybe need to change in a couple of years or in the next phase of life. But what are some of the things that you use in your own lives that you feel like are really helpful for you? Um, for me personally, obviously, would be therapy. Um, sometimes the meetings are, are more impactful um, for me. Um, and I also am a, like a very deep believer in DBT, which is dialectical behavior therapy. And that's something that I hold close to me. And a lot of those skills are things I've learned, like RAIN, you know, which is recognize and allow your feelings, investigate them, and then nurture yourself. And things like that will, will kind of re-pop into my head and, and it's reassuring. But it, sometimes I just have to let myself feel it mm. let it pass. Yeah, I love that. I, if I'm feeling something that I don't understand or I, I don't have a method for, I will sign up for a course. I'll find one online. And um, I sometimes complete them. I sometimes don't. But, like, I'll take those courses. And then I also... I'm a huge journal, as you know. I, I love to like create and, and write. It just soothes me. I think it gives me like a sense of control. Like I can control this moment with, uh, you know, if something's going on. And it just like, it centers me and brings me so much peace and helps me find usually the answer that I really need. So yeah, that's what I do. I would say um, a couple of things. I love the journaling idea. Um, the research tells us uh, one of the two ways that we can really get things off is to talk to someone or to write, right? It relieves pressure around that issue because you can think if you have a struggle with a significant other, um, as soon as that struggle ensues and it's done, what do you do? You oftentimes pick up the phone and call a friend and you begin to describe to them what you're struggling with. Well, innately, you know they can't fix it. You know they can't fix it, so why do we call? Because we want to relieve pressure. I want that pressure off of me. I want to talk about this and get it out. Um, the other thing, a tool that I think that, that is really important, especially as you engage with the things that you already currently have, is in my book I talk about creating a supreme court in your life. Those three, four, five people that know you well and will be truth tellers, not just will cosign, but will be truth tellers. So when I have struggles, I can go to my Supreme Court and say, all right, so here's, here's what's going on. You know me well, and I don't want no BS on this. Tell me what your thoughts are. I think I'm gonna do this, or I'm considering that, and get that feedback. If you go to three to five people that you're close to and they give you real feedback, a pattern will emerge. The truth will emerge. More often than not, you already know what the truth is. They just confirm it for you. So that's a little thing I think that, we, that you can use.
Yeah, um, I would say that probably the three biggest things I do for my mental health routines is like, I'm a big, big into therapy. You know, I've talked about it like during this talk, like therapy saved my life and just being able to talk and understand myself. And I just think therapy is great to be aware about yourself and who you are and be mindful, but just like, you get to know yourself more and more the more you talk with someone and someone who's trained to be able to, you know, reflect back with you. Um, and then journaling is big for me. I'm a big overthinker. I'm always in my head and like Doc just said, like getting things off my head and on a paper helps me kind of go through my day and, and not worry about those things, in my, those thoughts in my head anymore. Um, and then I'm a big meditator. Like, you know, my life is like moves very fast, like onto the next workout, next training session, rehab, next game. Um, so like, I always feel like the day is coming to me, but like when I meditate and I ground myself, I feel like I can then approach a day how I want to approach it. Um, but sometimes like saying these, like those three things, like therapy, journaling and meditating, like, they like are like big like mental health words like some that scare some people and like I'm just like to be honest like you don't have to like do those things to take care of your mental health um like taking care of your mental health can be as simple as getting enough sleep um making sure you're, you're getting 20 minutes of working out in a day um getting 20 minutes to 60 minutes a day outside of your job so you can kind of reflect or off your phone so you can be present um you know making sure you're getting like the, the right water intake um getting out in the sun like these are all simple ways you can take care of your mental health without having to do these things like it doesn't have to every time you take care of your mental health it doesn't have to be like a big exertion of emotions it can be these simple things like going for a walk um but like even past that like just having connectivity having community around you having people that love you having safe places are all ways i take care of my mental health so i can be present um and just approach the day the way i need to Helen's also really good at baking bread. <laughs> really good at it. <laughs> I just told him, when I, when I grow up, I want to be like him. Me too. I got, long way, I got long ways to go, but I'm working on it. Same. <laughs> I love that. I'm hearing a lot of us love journaling, and I know, Mandy, this is something we've talked about a lot. And shocker, I bought new highlighters this week. Yay. Um, I love that. Yeah. And what I'm hearing also about what so much of you all are saying is it's this idea of looking in words and thinking about the things that are critical to observe, your thoughts and your feelings being real, and then also looking outwards too. So talking to your Supreme Court, getting out there, doing exercise. And so there's this delicate balance of being in your head in sort of a healthy, therapeutic, productive way, and then also getting out of your head. So that you're not stuck there. Does that resonate? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's. I, go ahead. Well, first I want to ask: Do you have a woman on your Supreme Court? Yes, <laughs> my, my mom and my wife. I wanted, I wanted to sign up. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you're, hey, you don't have to sign up. You're already in. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. No, I, I, I feel like with. Um, the loneliness epidemic that we have going on right now, it's, it's, it, is, it should be an opportunity for us to really take that time to explore like individually and like internally and what, what you feel, but instead there's so much noise everywhere that it keeps you preoccupied that you probably don't have a clue what you really like like put that phone down turn the tv off like to do all of that and then like sit in that loneliness you'll probably last a couple minutes before you start squirming because it's real and that's who you are and you you need to listen to that because everyone is so alone and you're feeling it with like nonsense and and there's so much meaning and there's so much opportunity for you to ex like expand into the greatest person ever and to find that happiness. And you won't be lonely when you're alone because you have that, that relationship with yourself that you truly understand and it's not filled with other people's agendas. Let me say this, I love that. Two things, that we must be clearly understanding that my happiness is no one else's to give. It's mine. Mm. I will create my happiness. All of the things, people in my world can help facilitate that happiness, but it's mine. Mm -hmm. I own that fact, that if I'm happy, it's because of me, right? And we oftentimes don't realize that all healing, all happiness must come from within. 
You can, the healing must come from within. It does not happen from outside. I'm a therapist. I cannot heal anyone. I can facilitate their healing by being curious with them for this, so they get the opportunity to have aha moments and say, I had never, ever thought of that. I didn't realize that about by myself. Well, that's an aha moment, but that's your stuff. You, you had all that stuff in there. You just want someone to help facilitate it. Friends can do it. Therapists can do it. Tons of people can. But realizing, recognizing, healing, happiness must come from within. Yes. Yeah. And I think that aligns with something that I think about frequently. And unfortunately, we're about to run out of time. We could sit here for hours and talk about this stuff. But um, just very briefly, it aligns with something that I think about a lot is that there's this delicate balance also between venting a lot and also deciding when you're going to walk away from that process. And I think sometimes that's a delicate balance of trying to figure out how can I be productive in opening up, seeking support, versus when is it actually keeping me stuck in the pit? And how can I find a way to get out of that by turning some of those conversations into action in meaningful ways? And so in this vein, I actually want to take a quick moment to do a very quick exercise. Very quick exercise. I'm going to encourage all of you to think about three W's. You guys too. And if you want to take some notes, put this in your phone, please go ahead and do so. I'd like you to think about a wish, something that you wish for yourself, something you'd like to try to do, a goal you'd like to set. And you can come back to this later if you need more time. I'd like you to think about a wonder, something that you can be curious about, a question you can ask yourself non-judgmentally, reflective, something that's going to inspire you, move you forward, give you pause. And I'd like you to think about a win. What's something you're doing well? something you're proud of, something you want to keep doing. I hope everybody here can continue to reflect on these and maybe build on it, continue to seek inspiration, maybe share it with other people. And I hope that everyone here can take some food for thought from the incredible panelists that we have here and start to get uncomfortable with whatever it is that you have in your life and then turn that into something meaningful. Thank you. Before we wrap up, really quickly, I wanted to ask you all, do you have any resources, any organizations that you wanted to share, anything that you wanted to pitch? Because I know everybody here is involved in such incredible work and has access and alliance with, with such great people. Anything you wanted to share with our audience? Oh, y'all, so shy. My, I have a, a book that came out last year. The name, name of the book is How Am I Doing? 40 Conversations to Have with Yourself. And it really is about what we've been discussing this whole time. So um, it's everywhere, wherever you can find books. It's How Am I Doing? Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I just want to uh, talk about my foundation real quick. My family and I, we started a foundation called The Defensive Line where our mission is to end the epidemic of youth suicide, especially for young people of color by transforming the way we connect and com communicate over mental health. And we just go into schools, businesses, sports programs, and we um, teach any mentors of youth how to talk about mental health, how to look for the warning signs, where the behavior changes, um, the way they're acting, the way they talk, um, if they're sleeping enough, these kind of things. But also just making sure that, hey, they have the resources available and know how to handle crisis situations and just create a safe mental environment for all those around them. So, yeah, just you can check us out at thedefensiveline.org. We've been up for three years, and, you know, I'm proud of my team and all the work we're doing. Amazing. Obviously, check out Wondermind, Rare Beauty, the Rare Impact Fund. And thank you guys for being here today. Thank you. Yay.